You're listening to the Russell Bread Podcast. With one beer, two beers. You just went off this 360. Meet Tony. Oh my God. Tony? Yeah. Cut the shit. How many red carpets you guys want to walk in your $4,000 ridiculous heels? You will never be able to lace up my Chuck Taylor. This is your fault. This is your fault. I didn't get mad when you stole all my moves. Your daddy's not here anymore. It's How was your movie, by the way? Oh, I missed it. I, mine, mine went straight to DVD, just like yours. Careful you don't hurt your neck again going through those ropes. And the spirit of Ultimate Warrior will run forever! You're listening to the Russell Bread Podcast. What's going on, guys? This is JD, and this is episode 177 of the Russell Bread Podcast. So we had a eventful week. I mean, pipe bombs galore. Well, not really pipe bombs, but very good promos. We just had AW Revolution this past week, the fallout from it, and then a SmackDown and a Raw that a lot of people would love to get into and been talking about. Plus, of course, some news and rumors that has been floating out there. Um, So let's get into it. First of all, we are going on week, what, three or four of me not watching these XFL games. You would think that I am not a football fan at this point. It's like, I swear, I I would love to watch them. It's just the fact that they come on on Saturdays, I believe. And these past couple of weeks, my Saturdays have been like booked with like family events and stuff. Because, you know, it's no longer, well, it's still winter technically, but it's not as cold outside like that anymore. So, you know, family wants to get together and things like that. So, you know, my weekends have been completely crazy. I mean, this weekend I got plans. Next week I got plans. And the following weekend I got plans. And then it's WrestleMania. And then it's my birthday. So I'm not going to really get time to really sit down and watch something you know, on a free and clear Saturday, but you know, maybe I'll binge watch them at some point during the week or something. But I'm hearing that they're pretty good, that the rules are unique and things like that. And I even want to watch um the USFL once that comes out. I believe that comes out in April as well. I know that spring training has been going on. I get the alerts on the phone. I'm real funny. Just like the preseason, I don't really I like I watch the preseason a little bit of the NFL but I don't really get too much into it. And it's the same thing with spring training. Like, I don't really get into too much with spring training. Like, once the real games begin, that's when I'll tune in, I guess. But I get the alerts on the phone, you know, of, you know, Phillies beat this team in spring uh, spring training and stuff like that. So I'm just waiting for, you know, the Philly season to start. Open week, Opening weekend always happen on my birthday weekend. And so I always have tickets. I normally go to the Philly games and stuff like that. So hoping that they pull out another win for my birthday. They did. The last time I went to a Phillies game on my birthday, they did pull out a win. I'm hoping that they get to do it again um, this year. Also, they're doing the ring ceremony because they are the conference champions. So I get to check that out. Well, I'm talking like I have the tickets for it already. I don't even have the tickets for it already, but we'll get there. We'll get there. So let's get into enough about sports. We'll get into some news and rumors. So first of all, there were a lot of people who were feeling some type of way because Vince McMahon was reportedly at this past Raw. Now I was told that he was there because of John Cena and then the dirt sheets started to go a little bit crazy. People were freaking out like, oh my gosh, Vince is trying to take over again, stuff like that. Look, if Vince take over, he's going to take over. There's really nothing that we can do. I mean, how many times have people have threatened to cancel the WWE Network, cancel Peacock, don't go to shows, stop watching stuff like that? How about years later, I still see them people talking shit about WWE or talking shit about what happened on WWE Raw or SmackDown. So it's like, it doesn't matter if he comes back. Truthfully, if he comes back, he comes back. People are still going to watch. I know my my ass is still going to watch. I mean, as much as I like talk shit about Vince McMahon's booking and stuff like that, if it wasn't for this asshole, I wouldn't have gotten to wrestling today, truthfully. I mean, he is a straight up asshole when it comes to, you know, the way he treats his employees and stuff like that. But as far as his marketing skills and getting his business to where it needs to get to, 
he's brilliant. I give him his props. But I've watched this man do so much shit over the years. I kind of become numb to it, which, you know, should be sad, but it is the truth. I've come numb to a lot of the shit that he does. Not sitting here saying that, you know, what he does is not, you know, is it uh, good or anything like that. He done, he's an asshole. He's done some crazy shit. I'm surprised he's not in jail. I'm surprised that he's not getting sued out the wahoo, you know, he's, but as far as other people, people are like, well, if he comes back, I'm gonna stop watching. I'm like, no, you're not. No, you're not. Because you're the same person that sit there and say, you don't like AEW. We're going to start watching New Japan. You're going to watch NWA. You're going to give up wrestling altogether as much time as you spend talking about wrestling and WWE and stuff like that. We got the bloodline storyline going on, stuff like that. So it's like, look, if Vince McMahon comes back and takes over, I will enjoy the time that we had. I mean, Triple H booking was a hell of a lot better than Vince McMahon. Wasn't perfect, but it was a lot better. But people are like freaking out about it. And it's like, what are you going to do? <laughs> there are millions and billions of people around the world who will still watch this product. Really? If all of us Americans just stop watching, they'll just take their shit overseas or something. Like, Unfortunately, you know, Vincent Man is going to make sure this company thrives or he'll drag it to the ground. It's his company, truthfully. I'm happy that there are other wrestling promotions out there, that there are other choices and stuff like that. So, you know, if there was a, you know, Raw that was less than favorable, hey, there's some dream matches going on in AEW or there's some cool stuff going on in NWA. Hell, I I love to keep checking out AAA and watching Triple Mania and stuff like that and watch all the luchas down there. I could check out, you know, the Bullet Club and all that shit that's going on in New Japan and everything. So it's just like, it is what it is, re really. And then the, the dirt sheets even came up with crazier stuff. So apparently, um, the, like I said, the word is that he was there to visit John Cena, which is what I initially thought he was going to be there to visit John Cena. And then it came out that he was chilling in Gorilla the whole time. Well, I'm like, well, you know, that's where his son-in-law is. And a lot of people, his, you know, right-hand people was there. Um, so, of course, he's going to be more in the Gorilla position, talking to the people that he was very close to and who he worked aside, alongside the most. Like, do you expect him to be walking into the locker room or something like that? No. You know, normally when you come back to a job that you used to work at, you normally hang out with the people who you're really close to and you sit there and talk to them the whole time. So him just chilling in Gorilla, like, it, you know, that that doesn't really scream like, oh, my gosh, he took control of Raw or something like that. And then it gets crazier. So uh, with Wrestling Observer Radio, they're saying that Vince was only at Raw this week to visit John Cena, but it was something that they were simply telling everyone and there's more to it than anyone has ever been told or made aware of. So it's like, okay, so what's your, what's your secret? I feel like with some of these dirt sheets and some of these rumors, it's people who are being told speculations. Like if I go to someone and say, hey, you know, I think there's something going on with such and such. Like if I, if I go, if I go up to some, to like an insider or something like that, and I sit there and say, you know what? I think there's something going on with the Cowboys because like I noticed Jerry Jones did not go out for his coffee this morning. So I think there's more to what's going on with um that Prescott or something like that. And then they'll print out, oh, Jerry, Jerry, uh, Jerry Jones decided not to, did not go for his usual coffee break because he feels as though it's more important to think about Dak Prescott's contract. Like that's pretty much what's happening here. And so if there's more to it, then it's like, what are we going to do? Like if he, if he decide if he kicks Triple H out of the chair right now, like just drop kicks him, snatches the headset, puts it on and starts yelling in Michael Cole's ear. What's going to happen? Like the show is going to continue on. All the con all the talent are stuck in their contracts. I mean, we've seen it for decades of people who wants to leave WWE or WWF and they're stuck in their contracts and then they get screwed over and stuff like that. There is, we don't have control of what's going to happen. And I don't see why people are so up in arms about something we have zero control over. And then it gets even crazier because then Brian Alvarez from Wrestling Observer said that Vince McMahon snuck into the building. Vince McMahon snuck into the building for Raw. 
And I'm sitting here like, how the fuck did Vince McMahon sneak into the building? Like, I know there's a lot of security around. I'm like, did he like get a crew to sneak in like Ocean's Eleven? Did he like, you know, rappel down from the ceiling as in Mission Impossible? Did he, I heard he has a mustache. Did he like put on a mustache and some glasses or something like that? And, you know, walked in. There's Vince and Gorilla. How the hell did he get in here? Oh, he must have snuck in. Like, I'm pretty sure everyone knows who Vince McMahon looks like. He has a very recognizable voice. He he tried he tried to like um disguise himself for I think it was Swerved or something like that. It was some show that they did for the WWE Network, and he put on like this ridiculous um this ridiculous disguise. Tried to mask his voice. You uh, you could tell obviously the workers knew it was him. And they just tried to play it wrong because they didn't want to get fired. But you could tell clearly that it's him. So it's like, he didn't sneak into the building. He either told them early on, hey, I'm going to show up to check out John Cena or say hi to John Cena or Triple H, you know, or him and Triple H talked or one of them motherfuckers talked to Vince McMahon and he was like, hey, I'm going to swing past by to see John Cena. And that'd be that. If he shows up at SmackDown and hangs out in Gorilla, then you could sit there and be up in arms and do hashtag cancel Peacock or whatever, or hashtag never watching WWE again. Then you can do all that. But right now, he's just showing up at Raw. He shows up at Raw. He shows up at Raw. There's not really much that we could do. And then we have announced that Backlash is going to be in Puerto Rico in May. I forgot the date that they had said in May, but um, it's going to Puerto Rico with host Bad Bunny. And this is the first um, premium live event in Puerto Rico since January of, tw- of 2005. Um, the arena that they're going to be at seats 18,500 people. Probably will be closer to 1,900 or something or 20,000 once they do the floor seats and everything. I feel as though this is an excellent idea with um, having Bad Bunny. Bad Bunny is so damn popular in Puerto Rico. I don't know if you saw, I believe it was on Twitter or TikTok that I saw it, that uh, Bad Bunny put on like an improv concert in Puerto Rico. Like Puerto Rico loves him. He is like so. He is pretty much Bret Hart in Montreal over there. So I think this is a great draw to bring people in to check out WWE with Bad Bunny hosting, especially people who like don't even know what WWE is that they're just going there just to see Bad Bunny. It'll be great. I'm sure since it's in Puerto Rico, we may get some people from the U.S. traveling over down there. It's in it's in May, so you can have, you know, not really spring break. It's too late for spring break, but, you know, late spring break or something, a quick vacation to go over there and check out Backlash. But I think this is an excellent idea. The crowd is going to be so over. I'm hoping that they'll be over for the wrestling. Like, I forgot how the crowd was when they went over there in January 2005. But I think since it's a, not technically an international club, uh, international um, fan base because it's Puerto Rico, part of the U.S., but I'm hoping that there'll be a very passionate crowd. I think they would. Speaking of announcements, we also, I believe I said this last episode, we're going to have the King and Queen in Jeddah this year, I believe in June or July. I have to double check. I forgot when, but they did the promo for it during Raw, and interesting enough, the promo did not show the former King and especially the first Queen of the ring, which was Xavier Woods and Z- uh, Zelina Vega. And of course, Zelina had an issue with it that she wasn't even featured in the promo shot. I mean, they featured pretty much all the top people, Roman, Charlotte, uh, Bianca, I believe they showed Becky and Cody as well. So Xavier Woods went and fixed it. He uh, tweeted out a whole new video package of the promo and it shows all the former kings and the queen of the ring, which I feel like makes sense. Like I get that you want to put over the event by showing your top people, but you could throw in there some of the kings and queens as well to show like, hey, you know, this isn't the first time we're doing it type of situation. So going into AEW, um, according to PW Insider, that they um, AEW is planning to do a house show and it's saying that it won't be consistent at first, but they're simply feeling out the process and to see how to make it profitable and that Jeff Jarrett will be assisting it. 
Now, as far as with AEW, I don't know about doing house shows. Like, I don't know how we're going to do it. Like, you might as well just make Rampage live or something. Like, make a whole other show. Like, I don't know if they're going to be using top talent or if they're going to be doing something like Dark Elevation. Like, I don't know how we're doing house shows. You might as well just tape something, you know, do Rampage Live like they used to and have, you know, the first hour or two of Dark and Elevation man uh, matches and just do Rampage. I'm not understanding, like, why are we doing house show? You're going to have people wrestle on Saturdays or Sundays. Are you going to start filming Dark and Elevation Live as well? You know, so I didn't really get into, I didn't really look into too many details about how this house show schedule is going to work out. But those are my thoughts. Like you already have like four shows that you're showing this week. And then on top of that, now you have Ring of Honor. And then finally, as far as news and rumors, there was something that happened at AEW Revolution. I was going to get into it during my review of AEW Revolution. I figured I just might as well make it separate since it became this whole big ass debate. And that was the set that was the moment during the Iron Man match between MJF and Brian Danielson, where MJF goes into the crowd. He grabs a drink from a woman and throws it on the kid. Now at first I thought it was water and I was like, okay, that I thought it was plants maybe uh, someone who met the wrestlers backstage previously and then he said hey you want to be a part of the show you know yada 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 you can sit here throw the drink out stuff like that and then it just started things just started unfolding people were speculating well why did this happen this must have been a plan you know through water stuff like that and then come to find out now i don't know how true this is i don't know if this was confirmed by the mom, by the kid, by MJF, Tony Khan, that apparently this was a glass of tequila. And my first thought was like, wait a minute, you can drink a cup of straight tequila at AW over there? Where has this been? Like, they would never, never sell a cup of straight tequila in Philly. They barely want to sell beers to us. Um, and I'm not even a beer drinker and they barely want to sell beers. They barely want to sell any type of alcohol because we are crazy as is. So the fact that she has an open cup, mind you, of tequila is what blew my mind at first. And then it's like, wait a minute, she has tequila. He grabbed the cup. Now, obviously, you probably don't know that it was tequila unless, you know, I mean, you could more, sometimes you could really smell tequila and stuff like that. But I'm like, if he threw, apparently he threw it at the kid and it got into the kid's eyes and he got very upset as well. And it led to, you know, a lot of reactions uh, from AEW. Uh, Amanda Huber took the kid backstage. He met several wrestlers. The people in the crowd started giving the kid some merchandise and stuff. Now, it was that was confirmed by someone who was actually in an audience. Um, I forgot his name. It was like Will or something like that. He mentioned how when the kid got the drink thrown on, he became upset. The mom came upset. People started giving the kid their merchandise. Um, the journal, the person Will gave a phone, the acclaimed finger, and people other other people started giving stuff too. And then that's when AEW came out. Well, someone from AEW came out to calm down the kid. He was brought backstage. He met Powerhouse Hobbs. He also got tickets to the show in Sacramento. Tony Khan even addressed it during the media scrum, saying that he had a talk with a serious talk with MJF and the champion wasn't acting like a champion at that moment. And that the kid was a um, he said he was a pro at it, which, I, you know, it kind of gave you the thoughts that he was a plant or something or it was something planned. I forgot the kid's name. I think his name was Titus or something. But he mentioned how, you know, he spoke to him and he was, you know, great about it. And they got him tickets and stuff like that. And it really felt like they were like trying not to get sued because technically, even if it was water, if you throw a drink at someone, it could be considered assault. I'm not sure if that's how it is in the state of California, but it is considered assault. Now, as far as my opinion about it, um, first of all, I wouldn't have the tequila 
uh, tequila makes you do crazy things. But however, if I had a drink and MJF took the drink, threw it on my unsuspected kid, um, and it got in his eyes, like the mom was like in like slight shock. Um, me, I'm a mom there. Don't mess with my kids. I would have took MJF out. And you know, I know what you're saying, JD. MJF is a hell of a lot stronger than you. Um, a lot bigger than you. I mean, you talk about how, you know, you sleep weird and your back start hurting and stuff. You really think you're going to take MJF down. And I'm like, look, I will try my best. Like, I know I can't beat his ass, but I'm damn sure going to try it. Like, I'll take out your kneecap. I'll stomp on your toes or your big toe until it turns black. Um, you know, I'll scratch, I'll scratch at something. You know, I have, I, you know, my nails aren't sharp, sharp. But, you know, I can, I can scratch, you know, I can slap real hard, um, you know, kick, whatever, throw something as far, I'm sure the mom and the kid are very upset, rightfully so, you know, uh, you don't really ask to get a drink thrown at you. And there was people who was like, well, you know, she brought him to an AEW match, you know, what did you expect? Stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you expect MJF to put middle fingers up to you or say something to you or put you down and stuff, but to have a drink thrown you. First of all, if you throw a drink at someone at a bar, you immediately get kicked out. You'll probably get banned. If you just talk shit to someone, you'll more likely get a warning. You know, you'll just say, hey, calm down or else type of situation. But, you know, you can't throw a drink at someone. And I understand that MJF loves to stay in character but i really feel like one of these days he's going to do some shit and it's not going to be cool like he keeps talking about how he like can't wait to go to wwe wwe don't have you stay in character 24 7 like even when like rhea ripley gets interviewed and stuff like that or you know not everyone stays in character like not even the undertaker stays in character anymore he is like regular mark now so it's just like it works for AEW. But I don't think it's going to work for WWE that he's in character all the time, especially they're trying to get you to do like not really charity work. Eventually, you have to do something where you got to break character like he can't go to the signings and stay in character, give middle fingers like I don't know if MJF is really prepared for what it is that he is asking for by going to WWE like you can't go to signings and stay in character and give middle fingers stuff like that. Like, WWE don't really play that. Like, you could say things and stuff, but WWE fans are a little different than AEW fans. Like, you sit there and put your middle finger up at a kid, and they'll sit there and say, you know, that's all good and well. I'm very interested to see if that those people kept the same energy with the situation with, with Lacey Evans, when Lacey Evans went to try to high-five that kid, and she didn't, and people was up in arms about it. And then there was even people who were upset at Rhea Ripley because she made this little girl cry and Liv Morgan went and hugged her. And it was people who had an issue with that. And I'm like, they, those two didn't even put their hands on those kids or even threw anything at those kids. So it's just like, I'm hoping that, you know, you're, if you feel as though that, you know, what happened with MJF is completely cool, that you kept that energy with Lacey Evans and Rhea Ripley and all the times that wrestlers did shit with fans. MJF just kind of learns to calm shit down from time to time. Like, I know that at the meet and greets and stuff like that, he'll put his middle finger up at the little kids. He'll curse at them. He'll, like, I think at one point he told, like, one little kid that his her dad, like, hates her or something like that. You know, just shit that he, like, talks to the kids. And it's like, bro, you better calm down with that. Can you imagine a six-foot-something, 200-something pound dad standing there with his kid and MGF takes his drink? and tosses his own kid, I think you would have a completely different reaction. But like I said, if that was me and my son, or especially my daughter, and he threw a drink at them, I'm swinging. <laughs> I don't care. Security is not going to get to me fast enough, okay? Um, I'm swinging, all right? So let's get into, uh, since we were talking about AEW, let's get into the recaps of AEW. So since we are talking about AEW and what happened at AEW Revolution, let's get into the pay-per-view. So overall, it was a good pay-per-view. Um, I had some issues with a few things. Um, nothing too big, but 
I am happy that we only had the eight matches. The timing of it was acceptable, I should say. Matches overall, quality-wise, was very good. I know a lot of people are saying that this is the best AEW Revolution to date. I'm not that, I don't have the best of memories. I don't remember what the other AEW Revolutions were, were, truthfully. But I will say that this was uh, one of the better pay-per-views that AEW has put on. So starting out, we first of all, I completely missed the pre-show. I didn't even go back and look at it. I saw that it was the Lucha Bros who was on the pre-show. And I feel like um, heartbroken about it. But I am going to go back and eventually watch the six-man tag and check it out. So starting off, we had Chris Jericho going against Ricky Starks. Ricky Starks just oozes all the charisma. And I thought with the Chris Jericho uh, Appreciation Society being band ringside, I was afraid that they was just going to like introduce somebody new to Jericho's side. But I am happy that the match didn't like go crazy or anything like that. We did have Sammy Guevara who came out, um, but Action Andretti uh, came and started going after Sammy Guevara. And first of all, Ricky Starks had blocked the Judas effect, did his finisher and won the match. So I'm happy about that. Going into, I'll kind of go back and forth between what happened next at uh, Revolution with these matches. So after that, when we went to Dynamite, uh, Ricky Starks wanted to know who is he, who's going to go after him next. And then it was Juice Robinson who came out and attacked him. So we're going to have that feud again uh, between those two. I would love for Ricky Starks to eventually get a title, but with the main main title is such a bottleneck. There are like people who have who deserve that title before Ricky Starks to be a hundred percent honest. And then of course there's a TNT title that's just like tossed like a potato at this point. I'm hoping eventually Ricky Starks get into another great feud eventually win the title down the road after that we had the final burial first of all i thought this was a no holds bar match and then it was announced i believe at rampage that it was called the final burial match and i was like seriously we are doing a fucking buried alive match i mean i'm i'm happy that they like tried to slightly deviate from it but it's still a somewhat of a buried alive match there is no undertaker with your promotion sir so i don't know why we're doing it like i was cool with the casket match and stuff but like it kind of worked because we had it with darby allen and i'm like that makes sense because it's darby allen darby allen probably if he could he could probably he'll probably sleep in a coffin he'll probably sit there and skateboard and everything like that like punch out two holes at the bottom of the coffin for his feet get into the coffin and just skateboard away while in the coffin or something. Like, I I can see Darby Allen doing something that crazy. But with this match, first of all, shout out to Christian. Like I said, I really love Christian's uh, heel gimmick here with the douchebag turtleneck. He cut the sleeves off the turtleneck to rustle in it. Like, chef's kiss for that type of, you know, character design. There was a spot during the match where Christian was beating jungle boy with the belt i felt as though ray mysterio need to take a couple of notes here uh because you know that's what you need to do to your son jungle boy is just putting on you know the oscar moments and stuff like that towards the end where he you know did hit christian with the chair he was crying and then he rolled him over and put him in the casket and he sat there and like kissed him and put his hands on his chest and everything. And I'm like, bro, if you don't shut the fucking casket and let's move on with this match. Jungle Boy cried and he mourned and he closed the casket. The funniest thing was the casket, like the casket closed and it just immediately dropped down. And I was like, oh, whoa. And there was like a little puff of smoke that came up and everything. Like it really reminded me of like a D-rated horror film. Like it definitely... Like, I can definitely see something like that happening with, like, a Jason kill. Like, if you ever watched the Friday the 13th back in the day, like, Jason slash somebody, they fall backwards into a casket and the casket drops into the grave. I really see that. I really, I really thought of that uh, when I saw that happen. Like, very, 
amateur film type of stuff. So next up, we come to Match of the Night. And that is the House of Black going against the Elite for the Trio's Championship. Now, first of all, I love the House of Black entrance. If someone puts together a compilation video of all their entrances together, first of all, like including the entrance that we saw at AEW Revolution with Julia Hart, I'm going to dress up as her for Halloween. I don't know how I'm going to pull it off. And it's not even like I'm dressing up to like take kids trick or treating. We don't we don't trick or treat in Philly, just to let y'all know. <laughs> you don't trick or treat in Philly because it's more likely you may get a bag of something else versus a bag of candy for kids. So normally I go out places, I'll find like events, this family events that's happening, and then we, you know, the kids will dress up and go there. I can't wear the mask that she wore at AW Revolution, even though it was cool. I don't think I can get away with the with the um Freddy Krueger nail type jaw, especially if I'm going in somewhere. But we'll figure it out. And definitely follow if you haven't don't follow me. You can follow me on Instagram. I'll start putting stuff up there soon again. I put some stuff on there. I put on some stuff that I posted on TikTok on there. But definitely check me out. Um if I do decide to do a Julia Hart cosplay, quote unquote, for Halloween, I'll throw some pictures up there. I'm a big fan of Julia Hart since she came over to House of Black. Her look is so damn cool. I love the hat that she wears. And like she really like she's really good at cutting those type of promos that they do with that she does with House of Black. But of course, I love the entrance. I barely no normally I take notes of things of like highlights that happened uh during this match. This match I actually watched again. So after I think I on Tuesday I went back and rewatched this match because it was just so incredible. The match, of course, starts out with Malachi Black going against Omega. Of uh, actually, no, Buddy Matthews going against Omega, and then it went to Malachi going against Omega, and then um, I believe it was Nick Jackson who got tagged in, and then he wanted Brody King. Who and then when Brody comes out, comes in, and all of a sudden, uh, Nick like wanted to nope out of there. No one else wanted to tag in, but. This match was completely crazy. Um, there was a spot where Omega was sitting in a chair and Brody slammed into him. Um, first of all, kudos. I love a good sell. Okay. I love a great sell. The sell that Omega did to the black mask where he just like slumped into a damn split. And then of course the sell by, um, well, I think it was both of the young bucks to the black mass and it was just like the end portion where um the house of black members each did well first of all i forgot who i don't know if it was matt or nick who tried when they did the Meltzer driver i forgot who was the one who was jumping who's doing the springboard off the rope did the springboard and buddy matthews caught him in the face with a knee so good it was a really good match and we have new champions and i'm so happy that we got new champions the match was just chef's kiss. I know I, I'm a big, of course, I'm a big fan of the um, tag team division, but I do like the trios. You know, when when the trios work together well, because we had trios, and then we had trios that don't work. But trios like you know House of Black, the Elite, the Shield, the Wyatt family, trios that work so well together, like Chef's Kiss. Because you know that it's going to be, you know, the, you know, the sequence and the trust with that team is going to flow very nicely. So after that, we had the women's championship, Jamie Hayter, Soraya, and Ruby Soho. There was no, us uh, now I was checking out, I was watching this um, along with the Bloodline Entertainment Network. Be sure to check them out. And something that Ivan, he's from Circle Debate, pointed out, there was no promo recap package for the women's match. I thought it was very interesting that there was no, this was the only match that didn't have a promo package. I don't know why, you know, I don't know why. It wasn't like they were cut for time or anything like that. But yeah, I don't know why that didn't happen. First of all, I'm slightly upset that there was no Jay Cargill. I would love to see her cosplay. Allegedly, there was an original plan for her to lose at this pay per view. I have no idea who they would have her lose to and make it believable because she done beat everyone. 
but we had this match between the three women. It was pretty good. I'm and I was actually surprised that not really that Soraya like held her own because she was she has been ha- she has been a bit sloppy with her wrestling matches since she came to AEW between Jamie and Ruby Soho and her. It was um it was a lot better. It was there was now this wasn't completely perfect. There was a little bit of sloppy moment. Um there was a DDT that was done on Jamie that it looked like she actually hit her head. I don't know if like she was okay after that. But um in the end, uh Jamie Hayter retained, which I had predicted. Um and then after the match we had Soraya and Tony Storm. Britt Baker was there, was ringside, and so was Tony Storm. And so after the match we had Tony Storm and Soraya come in, start beating up on Britt Baker and Jimmy Hater, and then Ruby Soho had, you know, sent Soraya and Storm over the rope, and she looked like she was going to align, like, which side is she going to pick? And then she did the Pele kick. As soon as I saw that she was lining up, I was like, she's about to do the Pele kick on Jimmy Hater, which she did. And, you know, I sat there, let me, let me grab my notes, that uh, Ruby is she's the third man to join scott hall and kevin nash the outsiders to become a new fraction and they betrayed wcw i mean aew um no fans threw trash in the ring this time though it would have been perfect if ruby was interviewed right afterwards and ruby could talk about how she was in the company up north brother and all this other stuff but you know we had to save it for dynamite afterwards and plus if the women couldn't even get a damn video package, there was no way she was going to get a um, after match promo about how Brother Ted gave her all the money and stuff like that and promised her movies and all this other stuff, brother. Um, But she did do a promo afterwards. Oh, I forgot to talk about the fallout for the uh, for the trios, but let me get back to I'll get back to that in a moment. So then we had the actual interview with ruby on dynamite and it was pretty good it was she was you know telling us some truth in there that um the way that the fans reacted to her when she was in the women's elimination eliminator match i believe she defeated i forgot who she defeated i think it was tony storm or something like that and the fans were upset about it so i'm like okay so the reason why you you know decided to align with the outsiders quote unquote was because of the way you were treated by the fans when you're in AEW. She was always passed over as, you know, people cheering for her and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And it was actually a, a good promo cut by her as well. Definitely feel the emotion and everything coming from her. And she spoke some truths about what's been happening. The fans played right into this, the damn storyline. This is what happens when y'all start running y'all mouths. Y'all turn into a storyline now. And now because of y'all, we got the NWO 2.0. Well, no, not technically 2.0 because they 2.0 was what they did in WWE. So I would say 3, 4.0, 3.5-ish or something like that. It's y'all fault. Y'all should have cheered for Ruby Soho when y'all did. So getting into the fallout of the trios match, we had a match with Chris Jericho, Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, and Daniel Garcia. I forgot who they went against. I forgot who they went against, uh, but they had a match and afterwards Chris Jericho wanted a shot at the trio's titles, told the House of Black, come out, do the the best entrance in wrestling today. Currently in wrestling, I believe he said. And the lights go out, out comes the Young Bucks. And Omega was like, hey, oh, actually, sorry. I don't know why I forgot. They face AR Fox in top flight on Dynamite. Then comes out the elite. Omega talk about how, you know, the past couple of years, they stayed out of each other's space and everything. Then Don Collis just kind of comes in, takes the mic and tells um, Jericho that he's the second best wrestler from Winnipeg. Everybody's like, oh, Jericho challenges the elite. I don't know if the lights go out and then it was the event, the... They appeared on the screen, but then the House of Black appears on the screen and is like, hey, you want these titles? Then come. And then the lights go out. Lights come back up. The House of Black was standing at the ramp in between the Elite and Chris Jericho. 
And then he says, come get them. And of course, there was Julia Hart standing there looking cool as fuck. Oh, and then uh, kind of to kind of circle back with the trios uh, tag team, the trios um, championship, there was the spot where Kenny Omega gave Julia Hart a, um, wasn't really a V trigger, but more like a running knee or something like that, uh, that she took. So shout out to her for taking that shot. Took it like a champ and everything like that. I sound like Negan when I said that, but you know, it was good. So going back to AEW Revolution, next up we had the Texas Death Match. Um, pretty much an over and under of what, how long it would take for Moxley to bleed. It was about seven minutes and stuff like that. The thing is with this guy, he bleeds so much, like you kind of get numb to it. It's no longer special. Like you already know this man is going to bleed. If this man was wrestling on darker elevation, he'll somehow figure out a way to to bleed. This man, I don't like. I I really really would love to tweet at Renee Young and just ask her like, when he goes to sleep, does he hit his head on the soft pillow so hard that he starts bleeding? Like when he goes to take a shower, it, does his head hit the curtain and then he starts bleeding? It when he plays with the kid or something like that, the kid does the kid smack him in the forehead and then he starts bleeding like. I've never seen someone who just bleeds for just a regular match. This man could be doing, you know, a, a thumb war and he'll end up bleeding somehow. Like, I, I don't get it with this guy. It was as if, like, WWE held this man back from, like, really wrestling the way he wanted to all these years that he feel as though he has to, like, make himself bleed so he can catch up of all the times that he missed doing it when he was in WWE or something. I don't know. But this him bleeding is like turning into like the what champ uh, as of 2023. No one wants it anymore. <laughs> you know, no one wants it anymore. It's like receiving a rose from a guy and then you go to like you, you go to work or something and come to find out the guy gave roses to everyone else. Like it doesn't feel special anymore. Um, Shout out for Paige for his new theme as well. That was pretty cool. But yeah, this match. First of all, this match went on for 24 minutes crazy amount of time a lot of bleeding a lot of crazy shit that's happened though um there was the spot where moxley put Paige's hand in between two bricks and stomped it there was the dead eye on the barbed wire chair um there was a curb stomp on the brick which you know popped people i'm sure seth rollins is somewhere you know with his joker s gear with his ridiculous jackets just sitting there you know laughing and dancing and shit to no music a lot of lots of chaos and like i had said last week that we was going to end we was going to come back here and say you know what that was fucked up that looked like that hurt and it was a lot of moments in this match where i was like wow that's that's kind of fucked up and uh you know that looked like that hurts very very crazy ass match which i figured it was going to be and in the end we had um hangman adam page who won and I thought it would be possibly the end of it, but it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. On to Dynamite, we had Moxley, uh, I'm about to call him Cesaro, Moxley and uh, Claudio, who was in a tag team match against um, Alex Reynolds and John Silver. In the end, uh, the th the Blackpool Combat Club, I guess, effectively turned heel, started beating up the members of the Dark Order afterwards, Evil Uno comes out to try to save the day, but of course it's Evil Uno, so obviously he gets his ass whooped by Moxley and crew. And then out comes Heyman, Adam Page, and I'm like, we're going to continue this between these two, and then they go into another damn match where they start bleeding out and stuff. In the end of this match, the way the finish to the Revolution match I thought was pretty interesting, that Moxley was getting choked out with a chain, and I was like, I feel like Moxley would probably would have passed out at a certain point instead of tapping. You know, sure, vampires probably watch Moxley. <laughs> I was going to I was going to make a joke. You know, what? I'm going to make it like I feel like vampires watch Moxley like it's the hub or something like that. Like as much blood that man spills. Jeez. <laughs> um, but going into the next match, we had the TNT Championship. Wardlow going against Samoa Joe. Um, Hobbs was in the crowd. You know, this match this match went a little short. It was a good match. Um, the only issue that I had was the finish of this match, 
which was Samoa Joe like kind of passing out. First of all, I had Samoa Joe winning this match. Like we could continue this feud between Warlow and Samoa Joe without needing a title and put, being able to put the title on Hobbs. But in the end, we had Samoa Joe who passed out and the crowd didn't even really realize that that was the end. But, you know, and you like it kind of came like kind of sudden. They rung the bell. The crowd like really didn't have a big reaction to it at first. So, yeah, Wardlow wins the title. So then we come to Dynamite. We had now uh, because Wardlow had his gear missing and his title missing and stuff like that. Now it becomes a false count anywhere. They started out in the parking lot, went through the crowd to the staging area and things like that. And pretty good match between these two. Like I said, it was a pretty good, pretty good match between these two. It was just the damn finish. It was just the damn finish. Um, and that's the issue that I have with AEW that they have these great matches, but unfortunately they put on poor finishes. Like why does powerhouse Hobbs need QT Marshall to win? I know commentary like referred back to apparently when Powerhouse Hobbs helped QT Marshall with Ricky Starks and QT Marshall's like, oh, I got you. I got your back now. I'm like, why couldn't you just take this man out to dinner? Why you had to sit there and interfere in this match? It's Powerhouse Hobbs. His first name is Powerhouse. He don't need your, your, your weak ass help. I know QT Marshall is very like, he's very inf- influential backstage. He has a big role as I, I believe he's a coach backstage and everything but in front of the camera it's qt marshall like we don't need you dog we don't need you i would have rather for powerhouse hobbs to win cleanly here like just because powerhouse hobbs is the heel doesn't mean that we gotta we gotta go through you know the the cheating tactics and the interference and stuff i would have loved for powerhouse hobbs to win clear cleanly especially since you had the situation with the kid you had the you had the kid meet powerhouse hobbs and that's his favorite um wrestler and stuff like that you know brought tickets for the kid now the kid got a double whammy because not only that he had tequila thrown in his face he had to watch his favorite wrestler cheat to win like what (laughs) like what type of uh lesson are you trying to teach this poor kid like you know like get tequila thrown in your face and then watch your favorite wrestler cheat to win and now your favorite wrestler is like a full-blown heel like why couldn't powerhouse hobbs stay cool with the mean ass look and win cleanly like, I don't know. I, I'm really hoping that this doesn't turn into like a faction or something like that. We have enough damn factions and um, AEW. Like, this isn't this isn't like a high school on UPN or something like that. Like, not everybody needs to be a part of a faction or a crew. Like, some people can just be solo out here. Why can't you know? Why can't we have Power Hobbs on his own and he's just whipping ass? I don't know. I just really didn't understand that booking. But I am happy that Powerhouse Hobbs is now TNT champion, but it feels like this is just setting up for Wardlow to win the title again at some period, probably like in two to three weeks or something, once they run this story that was actually QT Marshall who took the shit because he wants Powerhouse Hobbs to win and stuff. I don't know. Like that it it, it kind of took the it kind of took the, the taste out of my mouth with him winning that way. Like, I understand that he is a heel, but come on, son. So next up after that, we had the four-way tag team match for the AEW World Tag Team Championship. We had Orange Cassidy who came out with the backpack. Um, The guns looked pretty cool. We had the Acclaim who cut their rap, calling the guns looking like single moms with the cheetah pants, which I kind of laughed at. Uh, Billy Gunn, first of all, living his best life. You know, he is so over at his like out of the four out of out of the people of the generation x he is the one living his best life not to say like you know triple h yeah he is you know head of creative and stuff like that but there's a lot of stress of having to plan out two shows week to week people complaining to you and stuff like that whenever booking goes bad now all of a sudden the fans turn on you and stuff like that you got your father-in-law still breathing down your neck hanging out <laughs> hanging out in the gorillas like you know them headphones sure do look shiny there son-in-law you know you got crazy stuff like that meanwhile billy gunn sitting here scissoring people you know being called daddy ass and having fun and laughing and stuff like that they were even backstage at um 
they even had a, a, a backstage segment on AW Dynamite where they were approached. So two, so 2.0 comes backstage to speak to the acclaim and Billy Gunn. And they start laughing. They was like, look, we don't need your help. We're more over than you. We're more liked. Billy Gunn's sitting there laughing and stuff like that. And then Max Caster telling them, we're on TV more than you too. So I popped into that one. But Billy Gunn is just living his best life, yo. Like, not like he, when he got to, he got to wrestle with his kids. He's like so over on a gimmick stuff. He could just sit back, relax and collect all the money because everyone wants to say scissor me daddy ass and everything. It's just like, he's so over. He's just living his best life. But with this tag team match, um, it was fine. It was pretty good. It went kind of what the way I thought it would go, that the guns would retain. Because I really didn't see them putting the title on the acclaimed yet. Um, ballsy if they did it to Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. I didn't see Orange Cassidy and Dan Housen really winning it like that either. So I figured that the guns would retain and, you know, FTR comes back, which is what we knew would happen. We knew that FTR was going to come back. Um, there was the spot where Max Caster was going to hit Jeff Jarrett with the guitar and Aubrey took the guitar from him and they booed the shit out of Aubrey because of that. The match was pretty good, but the gun club retains and now FTR is back. They're back to win their titles. They had a interview on Dynamite where he pretty much was like, you know, we had a great year and then everything went to shit. And now we're trying to have a great year again, and we're going to go after the titles and stuff. So everyone that thought that they were going to go to WWE, now allegedly their contracts, I believe, end in April or something, but the way that they were talking at Dynamite, it seems like they're going to stick around. So now we come to the main event, the Iron Man match between Brian Danielson and Maxwell Jacob Freeman. Now I must say, that I said in my last episode, I don't know if I would be able to take 60 minutes of watching Maxwell Jacob Freeman go against Brian Danielson. Now, I knew that Brian Danielson would put on a good match. I mean, that match, that man could wrestle in his sleep. But I didn't know about MJF. Now, I knew that MJF would hang in there because Brian Danielson, when he like really wrestles, he will make his opponent look good. I really didn't expect Maxwell to really dedicate as much as he did to this match. Now, I watched a little bit of the media scrum. I didn't watch the whole thing, but I did see during the media scrum that MJF mentioned all the preparation he went into for this match to get his stamina up, to get his strength up and everything like that, his eating habits and everything. And, you know, kudos kudos to this guy for doing that but yeah this match was a hell of a lot better than I thought it would be I thought it would be good I thought it would be you know those periods where you know a match will slump and then it picks up in like the last five minutes of stuff because it's very hard to do a 60 minute Iron Man match I mean the, the most that we saw it with that was pretty successful was Brett versus Shawn Michaels and Brett versus Austin. Those are two that I can think of off the top of my head. Of course, there are plenty of them in the history of wrestling. But even with those, the difficulty with a 60-minute match is keeping up the energy throughout the whole 60 minutes. A lot of times what happens is that the match starts off pretty hot and then for like a good 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, things really slow down. And it kind of like feels like it's dragging, like you can really feel the 60 minutes and everything. And then things start to pick back up in the last like 10 minutes, especially the last five minutes where you got to, you know, the tempo has to pick up and that you, um, you know, you start racking in the pens and stuff like that. But with this, this match, um, this was, the pacing was pretty good. Now, I will admit I had to run and grab a snack, grab some water and stuff like that. And I went and checked on my kids and everything. So there was a part, um, my kids had off the next day. So of course they were living their best life, staying up 
So I was I went to check up on them. And so there was a good like five to ten minutes that I missed of this match. Um uh, but even still with missing that, it was still pretty good. Um there was a, an orchestra for the um entrance for MJF, there was an orchestra that played his theme. First of all, I have a car and when I get a car that actually have like bass bass, and if you know, you know. I'm going to play the shit out of Brian Danielson's instrumental theme. Like, I like his song. The so- the singing is fine. But that beat, though, like, definitely needs to be played in a nice car, I have to say. Um, now, there were a couple of good spots there. Um, there was a spot that they were rolling around trying to pin each other like a video game glitch. The first pin for this match came, like, 25 minutes in by Brian Danielson. And then, of course, the um, wind started to roll in. Props to MJF for being smart. He did a low blow, and that gave Brian, you know, a 2-0. Two, two and then MJF was able to pin Brian Danielson twice, and now it was tied at 2-2. Two to two. A lot of crazy spots. Um, there was a tombstone on the, on, uh, on the table, on the floor. There was a lot of crazy spots that involved uh brian danielson's head and neck which is like you know i mean we get like a bit weary when it comes to head and neck but especially with brian danielson listen that man decides to keep wrestling you know what i mean i pray for that i pray for his health but some of them spots that he that was being done in that match was kind of like oh i hope he's okay after that then there was um a tie with 10 minutes left. Both men got a um pinfall and then Brian Dan well no not ben, both men. MJF got a pin um on Brian Danielson and then Brian Danielson went and got um MJF to submit as well and so we were left with about 10 minutes left with 3 to 3. And MJF at this point is bleeding, he's selling his knee and stuff like that. He was going to town on Brian Danielson's head and neck and everything. Um, And then at the end, I believe Brian Danielson had MJF in the LaBelle lock as the time was counting down. And that was the end. At first, they played it as if it was going to be a draw. They announced it. And then you hear Tony Khan was like, okay, yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah, okay. All right, what did you say, Tony? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, uh huh. And so we knew what was going to happen. It was going into sudden death that the match was going to continue. It was not going to end in a in a draw, which is like okay. My issue is, I felt as though we we really didn't need to do the um sudden death. Like we could have had the next five minutes happen as the five last five minutes of the match, um, because. MJF was getting oxygen put on him and he used the oxygen take to take out Brian Danielson. And then he tried to, I believe he tried to um, submit him right there. I, I thought they was going to do the whole Brian had passed out, which I thought would have been crazy. Um, but then fucking MJF put the LaBelle lock on Brian Danielson. And eventually, Brian Danielson tapped, which shocked the shit out of me. I had, I actually had Brian Danielson winning here. MJF um, retaining is a very ballsy move, I have to say. The craziest thing, though, is that Brian tapped. So then we go into Dynamite, where we saw videos of interviews that were conducted after this match. MJF, of course, telling everyone, you doubted me, this, that, and the third. I made him tap out. Kudos to MJF. He did great in this match, I have to say. He did great. He did a hell of a lot better than I thought he would in this match. Brian Danielson, on the other hand, was talking about, you know, he, you know, fights and everything like that. And he um, loves his family. But when he was in the LaBelle lock, he couldn't feel when he woke up and he found himself in the LaBelle lock. He couldn't feel his arm and he said that he was um, having issues with his leg or something like that and he that's why he decided to tap out. 
so he can still be able to play with his family and he said the next thing he's going to do is he's going to go home so it looks like brian danielson is going on a much needed vacation we'll probably see him again maybe at all out probably double or nothing or something but wow ballsy move to have mjf not only win but to win by having brian danielson tapped out if you had told me how if mjf was going to win how he was going to win i figured he was going to like do some do some fuckery and pin brian danielson off of you know cheating or something but instead he won by having brian danielson tap out to his own move so i'm hoping that with the next chapters with these two or the next chapter between these two because this has to be addressed that you know that it won't be forgotten the poetry of the finish to this match but like i said overall this was a very good pay-per-view i only had an issue with the finish for warlow the fact that we had sammy and you know Dan- that we had sammy come out to try to help out Chris Jericho. I just wish that we could have had, like, could have purely had a one on one match without trying to have any fuckery. And other than that, like, it was a pretty good pay per view, like I said. I just had the issues, but it was, it's issues I always have with AEW is the poor finishes. They love to do roll ups. (laughs) AEW loves a good roll up. Mm, Like, Chef's Kiss for, Chef's Kiss for Tony Khan is a good roll up. Um, but that's my issue with AEW, so it is what it is. So getting into the recap of Raw. So first of all, we had we had Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes come face to face. And who would have thought that that man, the tribal chief, Roman Reigns, with the suckering succotash and everything like that, the blue eyed Roman Reigns. If you had told me that I would sit here and be clapping and praising a promo that that man has done, I wouldn't believe you. And um, the promo that he gave to Cody Rhodes was so good. So good. This is who he should have been all along. Like, we didn't need blue-eyed Roman Reigns. We needed the tribal chief. You know what I mean? We needed the head of the table, okay? And when it came to these two, um, first of all, Cody tried to play Roman Reigns, like he was a punk, talking about some, well, you don't need your backup unless, you know, you're afraid or something like that, or unless you don't want to be left alone. And so Roman Reigns was like, wise man, get the fuck out of here, you know, uh, cousins, peace out type of situation. Then it came to, you know, the talking. Roman Reigns sat there and um, told him, you know, your dad trained me. You know, I was trained by, I was he said I was groomed by my dad and your dad too. You saw him pause because, you know, saying the word groomed probably wasn't the best of vocabulary words you could have used. But however, first of all, Cody started off about how he, you know, defied expectations and stuff like that, how he made it through Stardust and, you know, Randy Orton's lackey. And that was what a uh, uh, legacy, I believe that was all. And how he even sold out a little independent show um and i'm like okay like completely missing out the AEW. i believe he was talking about all in which sparked the creation of AEW, but he made no mention of AEW. roman reigns threw down the titles and was like okay he was like um have you ever competed for that and pointed to the title and then he said have you ever headlined for wrestlemania he said have you even gotten a title shot for one of these and that's when he talked about his dad and said how he was you know groomed but well I, even i'm saying the word groomed but how he was trained by his dad and by dusty rose as well he did an impression of dusty as well and he was like you know he would sit here and talk to me all the time and he would tell me about the future and how he will you know he sees me doing exactly what i'm doing now and then he said do you know what he told me about you and he said nothing he never mentioned you and roman picked up the titles and he's like look if there is anything your father didn't teach you i will and i'm like 
Ooh, I want Roman Reigns to win so badly at Ru- at WrestleMania after that promo. Like straight punked his ass, right? It's, I mean, Cody Rhodes is all about his dad, and Roman Reigns pretty much was like, "I'm your daddy now." Like, your dad taught me how to papa you. Like, whatever he didn't teach you, he taught me, and so now I can teach you. And so I'm like, okay, you know, let's uh. Let's have a bit of back and forth between these two. And then we had Cody Rhodes, the baby face, the person who I keep saying, you know, I like I keep saying every episode, I am the president of the haterade when it comes to Cody Rhodes. And this man continues to prove my point of the baby, baby face in it. He does it so much. Like the idea sparked in people's minds during the Royal Rumble when he was fresh as number 30, but he was struggling against someone who started at number one and I was wrestling for a straight hour. But he has to be, he has to babyface it. He has to be the underdog. And then he cut the return promo against all that Roman Reigns has said. And he was talking like an underdog. And I'm like, dog, he talked about your dad. (laughs) He pretty much said, I'm your dad now. You're like, your dad didn't say anything about you. And then Cody was like, oh, you know, you know, you are the uh, one of Dusty kids and stuff like that. And that means I have to be better than you. And in order for me to be better than you, I have to defeat you at WrestleMania. And I'm like, that's your comeback is to do is to cut the underdog baby face promo. Like you need to like get real. You keep talking about your dad and how your dad didn't, you know, win the big one. And you're going to do this for your dad and your daughter and stuff like that. And it's like, dog, like that was your moment to be like, you know, fuck that and fuck you. OK, I'm going to feature ass at WrestleMania. But then he went the underdog stuff. And I'm like, bro, I don't know what's going to happen if if they if they pull this off. and He does win the title, which, of course, the way that the booking is happening, it looks like all signs point to him holding up the title at Mania. You can't be an underdog ass champion. So I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how the booking is going to be once he wins the title. Like you can't be the underdog anymore. I believe it was AJ Styles who told John Cena, like you are now the New York Yankees. Like you're no longer the underdog anymore. Like once Cody Rose becomes the New York Yankees, you can't underdog it anymore. Like you're no longer an underdog. You're the man. You're on top of the mountain. What are they going to do? Start doing the whole Roman Reigns thing all over again? The one versus all and stuff? Like, no, come on, guys. I wasn't really that happy. <laughs> I wasn't really that happy with Cody Rhodes and the comeback for that one. So then we had um, a little more of that convicted felon, Dom, being backstage talking shit to Santos. First of all, shout out to Santos. He is so suave. Was backstage talking shit to Dom. And then blew a kiss at backbreaker Rhea Ripley. Um, And Dom did nothing but look at him. And I'm like, bro, I thought you was like this hardcore convict or whatever, felon. Like, and you you let dude come up to you to your face, disrespect you to your face, and then threw a kiss at your girl. Like, sir. Um, So then we had, so we were all wondering, since Brock Lesnar is going against Omos and not going against going through like everyone had wanted what is going to happen now for the IC title at wrestlemania and that has happened drew mcintyre comes out calls out gunther sheamus comes out um shirtless has of course um to say that hey you know what the title means to me i want to go after the title and then out comes LA Knight and I realize okay this is the get in line for a title shot segment because then it comes out LA Knight saying no you're not going to talk about LA mania without LA Knight which I thought was a pretty cool segue to that um he wants to go after the title and then this brings out New Day because um they had beef with LA Knight and they're saying how I think they want to go after the titles and then Karrion Cross comes out and he wants to go after the titles. And then everybody starts, you know, beating everyone's ass. I don't know if they announced something for this week as far as what they're going to do with this match. Um, but yeah, a lot of craziness going on. So we don't know. I guess we're going to have some type of 
a gauntlet or maybe or something like that maybe a um i don't know some craziness or something so that these people can go against each other and um find out who will be the number one contender for Gutha's title at wrestlemania we also had bobby lashley who um choke slam uncle howdy and i was, i still don't know what's going on here between these guys um uh, between with bray wyatt like what is the story here like are we just are we just like throwing things to the wall and kind of seeing what they what hits or something so smackdown of course was uh pretty good what mainly be with everything that happened with the bloodline um with roman reigns just throwing it down on uh on cody telling him like you know i'm your pathy now i'm telling you bloodline is a really good really good um storyline so then we get into a little bit of raw ko Sami Zayn just really wants ko to help him against the bloodline trying to talk to him and stuff like that ko is pretty much like dog you kicked me in my fucking face and celebrated it <laughs> at war games and you know of course ko really shouldn't have nothing to talk because of course ko has turned on Sami Zayn more than the big show has turned face and heel ko really don't have much to talk either but ko is like look i've been going after the bloodline by myself i'm gonna keep doing it by myself so then we go on throughout the day um we had a match between bianca belair and carmella with chelsea ringside didn't think um that chelsea and carmella will be a great pairing but they are kind of like the same person uh cue the spider-man pointing at each other um meme but yeah um then oscar comes along because uh carmella and chelsea green start attacking bianca belair oscar blows the uh, green mist into um chelsea's face and then you see oscar smiling weirdly at bianca belair then we had the segment with seth rollins and logan paul um you know logan paul it was it was okay um seth rollins just looking ridiculous as all ever of course just at, just deciding to wear like the most ridiculous thing that he could find either in becky lynch closet or whatever the closest thrift store is nearby as well they decided to make a match at WrestleMania. So it's going to be Logan Paul going against Seth Rollins. And then Logan Paul does the knockout punch. Seth Rollins sold it beautifully, first of all, um, of course. And then we get the Becky Lynch, Lita, and Trish going against um, Damage Control at WrestleMania for a six-woman tag match. And I'm still wondering, why did Becky Lynch and Lita win the tag team titles if we're going to get a six-woman tag at WrestleMania? Where is the logic here? There is no reason for them to win the titles, except for for Becky to say, oh, I won the title with Lita, and then for Lita to say, I won the tag team titles. Like, I'm not understanding why we, why we did that. I heard that the rumor is it's supposed to be Becky and Lita going against Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler for the titles. And I'm like, so you're going to give the titles to Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler? Ronda don't even come around here long enough for her to really be consistent with the title. So it was pretty weird. And then we get to um, the end of the match. So we had Solo Sokola going against Kevin Owens. Um, Kevin Owens won by disqualification because Jimmy Uso comes in to interfere. And then we had Jimmy Uso going against Sami Zayn. Sami Zayn wins. And then we um, had Jay Uso who appeared. He gets into the ring. and. Jimmy Uso looks like very not Jimmy. Uh Jay Jimmy looks confused and was like, you know what's going on? Jay is looking distraught and everything. He puts a fist to Jimmy Uso's chest and everything. And then he walks past Jay. Um then Jay walks past by Jimmy and then he gets out of the ring and stands next to Sammy and he starts talking to Sammy and everything. And he's like, you know. I trust you and everything. And then they hugged while Jimmy looked like, looked co very confused and everything and shocked. The pop when Jay Uso and Sami Zayn hugged was crazy. And you know, this girl popped because for the past couple of months, I've been asking Papa H, 
to do a Uso versus Uso. And I was willing to take a Sami Zayn and Uso going against another Uso and the little brother. As long as I get a Uso versus Uso. And I popped and I was like, yes, they're finally doing it. Yes. And then, you know, they hung, they, they raised their arms together. They did the, um, they did the bloodline, you know, put the ones in the air and everything. And I was like, yes, this is so awesome. This is so great. And then fucking Jay Uso super kicks Sami Zayn and says, you really think I'm going to choose my brother? You really think I'm not going to choose my brother? You think I'm going to choose you over my brother? And I was like, oh, I was like, fuck. They got me good with that segment. Applause. Oscar goes to Jay Uso for the acting during that segment to really sell like sometimes like once I watched it back I saw that Jay kind of like peeped over at him but you know they kind of like looked at each other and stuff like that like I saw it but I didn't like I didn't sense it coming until it happened because I was just so excited (laughs) I was just so excited about it all and you know Jay Uso did a very good job the pop though can we can we can Papa H at least see, notice that there was a such a big ass pop for Jay Uso and Sami Zayn to hug each other? But you know the bloodline shown that they are still strong. That blood is thicker than water, which I appreciate that part. You know that we're consistent with it. It's the bloodline. Blood is thicker than water. <sighs> but you know, I'll just hope for Uso not really to break up the Usos. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't want them to permanently break up the Usos. But we can kind of do it to where as though, you know, Uso versus Uso, get your frustration out there and stuff like that, and then get back together stronger than before. Like, we don't have to permanently break them up like that. Like, we're not, I'm not asking for them to go on a singles run or anything. No, just have them beef up a little bit, you know, and then they sit there and say, hey, let's, let's just sell this in the ring. You know what I mean? Like, like we're, we're, we got, we got problems. Let's just sell in the ring one good time. You know how it is. If you got a sibling or like a little cousin, or a friend, or something like that, sometimes y'all get into a fight, and stuff like that, you know, and y'all be like, you know what, just one time, let's just, let's just get all out there, you know what I mean, slap box, whatever, just get it all out your chest, and we be done, we, we cool, we boys after that, so, that's how I kind of want it to be, I don't need it to be, like, completely hate, or something like that, I don't need, no, I wish you died in the womb, like we had with the Bella twins, or anything like that, no, I just want them to throw on a good match. Like, even if it's like, um, even if it's one of those like tournaments for like a title or something like that, or King of the Ring tournament or something, and then that ends up being Uso versus Uso, that's all I want. Like, I'm not asking for a whole ass storyline for it or anything. I just want the Uso versus Uso match. I know it's going to be really good. That's why I'm asking for more than one, and I'm hoping it's a few. But, you know, if it's just a one off match, and, you know, that be that. On, on a on just a pay-per-view or something even if they just go low enough to give it to me on a raw or smackdown i'll take it hell you can even do it in nxt uh non-colorful nxt for all i care i just wanted to see what it looks like that's all <laughs> i guess if i have to wait to, and do it in we 2k23 or 2k22 you know what i mean but such a great segment this stuff with the bloodline is really good. Like we had, you know, Roman Reigns with the awesome promo against Cody Rhodes. And then we just see this shit happen with Jey Uso. So then, and of course we had, um, we had the Usos and Solo start attacking Zayn and stuff like that. And then out comes fucking Cody Rhodes. <laughs> like, I get it. I do get it. I get it. You know, he is going against... He's going against Roman Reigns, so he's the one that has to come in to save, but, you know, whatever. And then earlier, first of all, something I even forgot to mention, we had John Cena come out to talk to Austin Theory. And Austin Theory, first of all, John Cena, when he, like, really starts, ever since he, like, technically retired, he's been cut, he's been coming back to, like, cut some damn truth to people. He sat there and told Roman Reigns, you can't handle the spotlight. That's why they keep calling me back. And then he just went to town on Austin Theory. Sat there and told Austin Theory that he's not going to face Austin Theory because pretty much you're not worth it. And I, you're not ready for the spot. And if you face me, I'm just going to ruin your career. And I'm like, damn, do you know how it, you, 
Do you know how Theory probably feels to sit there and be told, I'm not going to wrestle you because I'm going to ruin your career? Like, we're talking about John Cena. Like, five moves of doom, John Cena. Like, colorful t-shirts, the Fruity Pebble t-shirts, as The Rock would say. We're talking about that John Cena. And if John Cena is telling you, I don't want to wrestle you because you're not ready, and if you wrestle me, you're going to ruin your own career? Like, do you know how bottom of the barrel you must feel about that? And then, of course, the crowd wants the match and everything. So the crowd was cheering it up and everything. And then John Cena had accepted the match for WrestleMania. And then he brings out Cody Rhodes. And I was a little confused here because I'm like, Cody Rhodes has a fucking match at WrestleMania. Like, I get what they're doing here. It's the whole passing of the torch. And is John Cena, like, passing the the good guy underdog torch to Cody Rhodes, but how many fucking rubs does this guy need? How much baby facing does he need? John Cena brought, called out Cody Rhodes and brought him out here and raised his hand and everything. Like he just started wrestling or something. Like you would have thought that he was Gabe Stevenson, the way that John Cena called out Cody Rhodes and hold up his hand and stuff like that. And then they went to commercials. So I thought that Maybe Cody Rhodes was going to have a match or something, or maybe cut a promo or something. But nope, we didn't. We come back from the match to something else, and then he comes out at the end. So, like I said, I'm just very interested to see what's going to happen once he gets the title and all this other stuff. He tries to do this underdog baby facing again. It only is going to work for so long. Like, this whole underdog baby facing, I'm going to rise from the top type of situation. It only works for so long. So I'm very interested to see on how this happens. I did check out a little bit of NXT Roblox. Um, some of the matches. I did check out the segment with uh, Grayson Waller and Shawn Michaels. I missed the opening match with... Um, I was kind of in and out with the other matches. Like I didn't see the opening match with Tony D'Angelo and Dijak. I saw some of Braun Breaker and the Creed Brothers going against... Um, Jinder Mahal, Shanga, and Veer, which I completely forgot Veer was in NXT, um, because we were all waiting for him to come to Raw. Remember that? Um, but here he is in NXT. I did check out the GG versus JC Jane, which I figured that GG was going to win that. I wish that they had waited for this match to happen at, um, Stand and Deliver, but I'm guessing they're going to up the stakes with this because then jc had attacked gg so i'm guessing we're gonna have like a i don't know some type of stipulation match going with this as well i didn't really see i saw a little bit of joe gracie and andre chase um and then i checked out um most of roxanne going against uh miko and i saw the ending portion where roxanne had passed out after the match so people thought i mean in my opinion i feel as though it wasn't a legit injury, even though the way that she did it. To all my old school fans, if you would please turn your history books back to the 90s and unlock a memory for me. Uh, when Shawn Michaels was going against Owen Hart and um, Owen Hart had Jim Cornette in his corner and Shawn Michaels had clothesline Owen Hart to the outside. Shawn Michaels then powered himself back into the ring, started celebrating everything like that. And then he grabbed his head and then he fell to the ground. And out comes, uh, first of all, Owen Hart legit looked like, like, what the hell is going on? The ref went to check on Shawn Michaels and then out comes the medical, well, out comes um, some of the people in the back. Vince McMahon goes from commentator to actual owner. He goes into the ring. To see what's going on then the medical staff comes to take Shawn michaels away everyone looks you know very concerned and crying and everything like that now back in this time i would say what maybe 90 this was about 95 ish i was in love with Shawn michaels which probably isn't too surprising because it's Shawn michaels but i was in love with Shawn michaels one of the few male wrestlers that I like really, really like loved. Um, I like I made a wrestling scrapbook with him in it. Like it's I had I'm um, date myself. I created V like VH tape mixtapes, I guess I should call it. 
um because i would go and record on vhs only like his promos and his vignettes and his matches and stuff all on one vhs tape like yeah i was in love with him i was i liked i really liked Shawn michaels from not too long before his um iron man match with bret hart to not too long before dx once he started doing dx and stuff that's when i was like ah never mind <laughs> no thank you i no longer am in love with you but yeah i loved Shawn michaels at this point so the story for this was that Shawn michaels wanted time off he went to vince mcmahon about it vince mcmahon gave him the idea of having this concussion no one else knew that this was um something going on that Sean was actually faking this injury, including Owen Hart, who had no idea, the ref who had no idea. Allegedly, uh, the situation with this went so deep and so far that Shawn Michaels actually had himself checked into the hospital and he was given time after that. But come to find out, it wasn't all real. So when we come back to Roxanne, um, I felt as though this may not have been real because the first thing that came to that I noticed when she had collapsed, that when the ref was waving to people, was waving for help, it was the referees who came out first, not the medical staff. And then um, we had the referees who came in to check up on her some more. And uh, Miku was looking very concerned, of course, but it was more refs in there to check up on her. And I'm saying here, like, how many people does it take to see if she is, you know, conscious and breathing? It only takes one person. And then, so it's the three zebras waving down the medical staff. We had the medical staff come in. They're doing their stuff, putting the neck brace on Roxanne. Um, and then they put her on the stretcher and everything. And then they kind of like paused and everything. The people kind of felt low. It was, it was um, not, it was storyline based because the camera kept following. But then like, they they were very casual about putting the oxygen mask on there, which they put the oxygen mask on her. It fell off and they had Shawn Michaels put the oxygen mask on her. They kept stopping and everything. It's just like, and then they already had an ambulance waiting. And normally there, if there's an ambulance waiting, it's just like chilling, like parked somewhere. Like we saw, like it's more believable with WWE because it's in the receiving area where you have cars and stuff like that even though with NXT it was in the parking lot but it was parked on an angle right outside the door just nitpicking here but I feel as though Roxanne is fine I feel like this may be to give her so a little bit of time off maybe you know she wasn't exactly I wouldn't say 100%, but maybe they just wanted to give her a bit of a break or something like that so they can build up whatever story it is that she's going, of who she's going to face at Stand and Deliver. I mean, we only got like, what, three weeks, three, four weeks left until Stand and Deliver. So we don't have that much time, but I'm guessing she's going to be signed off. They're going to just do this to sign her off for next week. Or this could be completely 100% true and she actually did collapse. Um, which I hope she actually gets better. In my opinion, I feel as though this is just storyline base. What story? No idea. But this is like the second storyline of Shawn Michaels that we've seen played out with the women's division. Of course, the first one is the infamous barbershop scene, which is what we had with Toxic Attraction between um, with Gigi getting kicked in the face on the door during the ding dong segment ding dong hello segment with bailey so i wouldn't be surprised if Shawn michaels is going through his career just pulling out storylines and stuff like that to play out for some of for some of the people so and then we had the grace waller segment where he was pretty much kind of like challenging Shawn michaels to face him and then it was johnny gargano who's going to face grace and waller which i can't wait to see I do really miss the original version of Johnny Gargano's theme. I don't mind the new one too, too much, but the original theme had like a, like, it was more punchy, if that makes sense. But, and he, like, NXT Roblox, from what I've seen, was pretty good. NXT, a non colorful NXT isn't really too bad. You know what I mean? It's not, it's, it's not a lot of craziness or anything like that. It still has a bit of a flair to it of um, black and gold NXT. It's just a hell of a lot more characters. Like, there's more concentration on the characters 
than the actual rustling. But when we get the rustling, the rustling is very good. So that's the only like slight variation with this non-colorful NXT. But overall, this past week, we had a lot of great wrestling. But that's it for the WrestleBread podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at JDC137. That's J-A-Y-D-E, the letter C, 137. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter at WrestleBread as well. Be sure to click the links in the bio for the Facebook, the Instagram, the YouTube channel, and the TikTok. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Leave a comment, like, subscribe, comment. Let me know your thoughts, how you felt about AEW Revolution. What was your favorite match about AEW Revolution? What was your least favorite match of AEW Revolution? And what do you feel are the next steps with some of the things that we saw this past week, especially with Roxanne? Uh, How do you feel about MJF's? a uh, little incident with the kid um and everything like that but thank you for listening um coming up next week we'll be going towards the road to wrestlemania of course i believe we'll be working towards double or nothing as the next pay-per-view for AEW, unless they have some other type of special coming that i completely forgot about and uh be on the lookout like i said i'll be doing a lot more with because we have wrestlemania coming up uh, we also have the four-year anniversary of the podcast coming in April as well. So it's going to be a nice, eventful week coming up. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, guys. Bye.